All right. Um, so a few spring vegetable steps for um, summer success. So this is a slightly chronological uh, discussion. And so as we think about a few of the things that are coming up over the next few months, um, I kind of divided this into um, you know, topics for the month that would help lay a good foundation and uh, success for our summer garden. So um, February is going to be selection. And of course, uh, if you know, if you know me, you know, I love uh, trials and to talk about um, some of our data. So I've got a little bit of that uh, to talk about then. Um, in March is, of course, we really ramp up our seedlings. And so we'll talk a little bit um, about some of the hurdles and some of the issues that we might see um, in some of our transplant production. And then, of course, in April, we start to get into that time of year when, you know, we can really go into the garden, but is it time yet? You know, what are the, uh, what are the factors there? So February, this is, um, and of course, January too, we're doing it, we're doing it right now as well. Um, but uh, selecting for success, and this is, um, this is kind of the easiest time of our vegetable garden uh, calendar, right? We get to sit back and order seeds and just dream about um, a great summer to come. And so um, it's all about balancing our personal preferences uh, with all of the possibilities and the newer options that are available. And of course, as a, you know, as a vegetable person, I find it, you know, really exciting that we have a lot of our seed companies that are really starting to focus a little bit more of the breeding and their promotion on what really works and is desirable from a home garden perspective. And of course, we are now living um, in year two of what might be, you know, Gard vegetable gardening um, super, you know, with, uh, with the pandemic interest. And so I feel like we're at a crucial stage in terms of helping people build on the, um, you know, the interest that we saw last year while hopefully solving some of the problems that they might have. And so trials and knowing what really performs well and helping people make the correct decisions in their vegetable garden, I, in some ways becomes even more important when we have um, a higher level of interest, which I certainly hope will continue this year as we're, you know, still very much um, confined in many ways due to the pandemic. So trials really give us a good way to kind of balance um, those aspects of what's performed well and what some of the disease prevention tactics that we have. So as soon as I get done talking, you know, I'll put some of the um, links in our, in our chat box so that you can access this, but our um, home garden variety trial report is hot off the presses. It was just released in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we have information for not only all of the trials that we did in 2020, which I'm going to talk a little bit about at the top of this presentation, um, lots of, uh, you know, data and comparisons of some of these common cultivars, but we also have at the back of that publication, a nice running list of some of the best performers for 17, 18, 19, and 20. So we're starting to get a good reservoir of what's done well over time, many of them in multiple years. So the end of that publication is also uh, really very useful as a couple of page um, handout. So what were some of our favorites uh, from last year? Um, we always enjoy doing uh, bush beans. Um, this year, um, the, you know, the statistics had these pretty close, um, but provider, uh, one of our old favorites right here on the right is provider did very well against the newer, in some ways, uh, maybe a slightly higher eye appeal um, on Annihilator, but, um, but pretty good performance and yield for, for both of those. Um, we always enjoy uh, including in some uh, filet beans. <laughs> for our um, non-traditional Southern bean growers. And uh, last year for uh, the second year, actually, Maxabel um, was a standout uh, in the trial. Um, statistically, you know, they were uh, close, but we had first fruit. I mean, I know in my own trials, I saw higher yields and just a really beautiful, um, pretty long uh, bean. The Tavera is more of a kind of a standard, smaller size when we talk about these French filet beans, um, but, but both of them did uh, pretty well in the trial. We always enjoy doing uh, some blind trials and having people rate things that they don't know what the cult of our name are to make sure that we don't have any bias um, in our sampling. And so last year, um, Amethyst, which was the purple bean right there, was the winner of our blind trial and really one of the standout performers um, across the uh, the entire trial. So it does not necessarily hold its beautiful bright purple color all the way through cooking, um, but it was a productive and attractive compared well in my own trials against some of our more standard uh, green beans. So which is always pretty good for some of the uh, colored bean options. Um, rattlesnake with 
100% of the people who would recommend it. You can see beautiful modeled colors there. On the left was the winner of our heirloom trial. We always enjoy doing some Southeastern or some um, heirlooms. And, uh, and this was our, our favorite with very good ratings, probably one of the best ratings that we've seen in a pole bean so far uh, for the rattlesnake. Um, we did edamame uh, again, so some edible soybeans. And we did this the first year in 2017 and got highly mediocre results. Um, but I think our gardeners are getting better at growing some of these newer and novel crops. And uh, tankero, which was a dark seeded um, edamame, actually was um, a very, um, very strong performer uh, in the trial. And so we look forward to, you know, being able to share some of these new and more novel crops uh, with, you know, some of our younger gardeners and folks who are getting interested in this in the first time. Um, so, of course, we've got some novel, but we also have some very standard uh, crops. General Lee, this was the second time we'd done General Lee in the trial. Um, and as a pretty um, broad disease package, it did very well in the trial and built, beat out actually a newer and potentially slightly more downy mildew resistant uh, cultivar that um, came out of the uh, Cornell breeding program. So um, some of our you know, more Southern standards continue to do well uh, in these trials. Um, one of my favorites from the trial uh, were our snacker cucumbers. And so these are thin skinned seedless if you don't have them uh, with other um, seeded cultivars nearby. This is Muncher um, in the background. It did fine, but I really think that green light was probably the standout in the trial. Statistically speaking, um, higher rated for first fruit and for yield, um, and it had a very high percentage of people who would recommend it. So really good for a quick return um, on your cucumber investment. Um, for the second year, um, again, in 2018 and in 2020, Sugar Cube, a um, really sweet, pretty good. Uh, so it has soil fusarium resistance um, and a very prolific, small, um, easy to determine when these fruit are ripe. So I think it could be very good for kind of early uh, melon growers and 100% of our um, trialers would recommend it. For the first year, actually, we had pretty good um, ratings on some of the watermelons that we've done in our trial. We've typically found that on some of these longer season crops, um, we tend to have more issues with you know, with germination or with uh, pest and disease issues to get all the way uh, to harvest. But this year, um, with an 8.5 rating, this is Sweetie Pie here on the left with a nice solid uh, dark skin. You can just see a little bit of mambo in the top. I actually took this picture to talk about, you know, uh, pr proper harvest time when the um, underside starts to turn a little bit more yellow. But we can see uh, pretty good uh, reviews and we're starting to actually now get a little bit of a background to really talk about good performing watermelons for folks across Tennessee. Um, zucchini, green zucchini, always one of our favorites and the highest participation items that we have in the trial. This is uh, desert right here on the left. And you can see a 9.0 rating with almost 90% of our trialers who would recommend it for others in Tennessee. Um, significantly better rated on health, on first fruit, on yield. Um, so a good solid um, range of viral disease resistance uh, which we're starting to see a little bit more of those um, viruses come in in some of our uh, southern zucchini. So a really good performer uh, overall. For the second year in a row, folks really like yellow zucchini. Um, and so gold mine is the solid uh, up here on the, uh, sorry, gold mine is the striped right here. Golden glory is the solid up there on the top, um, both with a very high uh, recommendation percentage. Um, in my trials, uh, golden glory was actually a little bit um, better yielding, uh, but folks really like this uh, novelty and, um, and the interest in the bright color. Um, for probably the third or fourth year, um, basil has been one of our highest participation items. Um, and we always try to include some uh, cultivars that are appropriate for containers. Everleaf is a nice compact cultivar that can work well in ground or in containers. Had a very good rating and a high percentage of folks who would recommend it. Um, and then Obsession is a newer downy mildew resistant cultivar coming um, out of the Rutgers breeding program. And so both of these perform very well uh, in our trial. Um, so hopefully, you know, these trials provide people an opportunity to take advantage of what some of the experiences of other people around the state are, while also for those who are interested in opportunity to participate themselves. And we are now uh, taking participants over the next few days, we'll start to ship out seed. And uh, we're really excited about the options that we have in this year's trial, some um, novel okra, um, a whole range of uh, different squash from yellow uh, to striped green. We're doing more cool season crops this year. 
um, trying to get those shipped out early to participants. Um, so we have a couple different lettuce selections as well as Swiss chard uh, for the first time. And we also have um, a few cultivars that are specifically selected just for those who really prefer to grow in containers. We have uh, just over 50% of our trialers that actually grow in either containers or raised beds only. So we really need to recognize the fact that we have a lot more of those small space gardeners and we're trying to make sure that we have good trials that are options for them. As well as borage um, pollinator options when we think about um, borage and uh, some of the bedding type zinnias. Um, we got some fun heirloom beans coming and uh, as well as yard long beans uh, for the kids. So um, that's a little bit about um, February. Uh, February is fun. You know, we get to uh, make all those selections and then, you know, we start to get into the late part of February, the early part of March, and the real work begins when we talk about um, starting our own seedlings. I know we've got Lee and some other folks on here, so you have some great um, seedling growing uh, expertise here. Um, now, of course, the timing varies, right? So on a pepper, you know, you want eight to ten uh, weeks to get it to full size. Um, I tend to do a lot of my seeding for uh, tomato and pepper transplants right around the first week in March. Some of y'all are definitely a little bit uh, further west than I, and so it might be in the late part of February, but the same uh, practices um, generally uh, go. So in terms of avoiding seedling diseases, this bacterial leaf spot on pepper, which is probably one of the most prevalent diseases uh, that we'll see on peppers. And, and many times it is actually a result of seed infestation um, that then spreads very rapidly. You know, it's a bacterial disease that spreads really easy with water splash in a greenhouse growing environment. Um, and so starting off with uh, clean seed, especially for some of those common bacterial diseases can be a great way, um, not only for the homeowner who's starting their own uh, plants, but also for those who are shopping just to be familiar with the fact that there are some common seedborne diseases that can uh, trip them up. I know that I have, you know, certainly seen uh, pictures come through from, you know, producers who struggle with uh, bacterial leaf spot. And so it's really important all across the, uh, all across the spectrum. We're beginning, especially in our tomatoes and peppers, to have a strong kind of palette of resistance that home gardeners can choose from, especially if they're buying newer seed and they're willing to start some of their own transplants that may be a little bit harder to find. So we have a lot of bacterial leaf spot resistance and a lot of the newer bell pepper cultivars and even some of the jalapenos. Um, we have a a lot of late blight resistance for our tomatoes and more and more um, options in terms of early and light blight for uh, tomatoes. So we just want to continue to make people aware of what some of those options are. Now, what are the challenges that we might run onto uh, when we talk about uh, starting seedlings? Well, this may be um, one of the most common challenges. So this is kind of the early to mid stages of uh, damping off in a young uh, pepper transplant and uh, peppers are you know especially um, prone as kind of slower germinating they have some higher temperature needs and uh, what is damping off well it's kind of a complex of uh, diseases it could be rhizoctonia it could be pythium um, but it's something that we see a lot if we have um, kind of seedlings that are starting to wilt or, um, or pinch off there um, at the stem right around the soil line um, then it very well could be kind of this pathogen complex that we often refer to uh, as damping off. So um, I would always encourage people to be picky about your growing uh, media. Don't reuse, don't bring in some old topsoil. Um, pythium and some of these other uh, pathogens are things that we would kind of refer to as ubiquitous in outdoor soil, um, and, but they can especially be damaging um, when we're talking about young seedlings in warm and moist growing environments where we're really making the conditions quote unquote good. Um, how we manage the water can be important. Those two pictures that I just showed you of those peppers, those were my seedlings from last year. And that was an issue of mist bed being set on too high a frequency and those um, seedling trays were just staying too wet. Um, some of these diseases tend to be worse in cooler soil or media temperatures. So if you're trying to germinate your peppers at 58 or 65 degrees instead of 75, you could run into more trouble. Um, poor air movement. Um, <laughs> I have even seen uh, seedlings killed by kind of over fertilization um, at a young age, probably less common, um, but, uh, but it can happen. So proper selection uh, of your substrate is critical. This is a you know, brand new, essentially pathogen-free 
um, germination mix, we can see the small size of perlite there. Um, and so this is going to be a fine mix that's going to do a good job of holding water for those young um, plants, primarily peat um, and perlite. We also tend to sometimes see um, a little bit higher levels of vermiculite in some of our germination mixes. Um, so we always want to keep in mind that those um, finer textured mixes are great for germination, but not as good when we get to transplanting them uh, for a larger size. Um, proper selection, brand new or very clean uh, containers, um, clean tools, clean hands. There could be time when um, some of those uh, pythium, you know, and other damping off diseases could actually be introduced by tools, by hands, by containers that had had, um, you know, field or garden soil in them. So there are lots of good options as far as um, media and containers, but we want to make sure um, that we're starting off um, as clean and healthy as possible. Whether we grow uh, in an open flat, um, this, uh, this is a good picture to kind of show a little bit about what can happen um, if you use too fine a mix to transplant up, right? So this is um, a seedling tray that's, these are in a 36 um, cell tray. And you can see, um, you know, a little bit of algae on the surface of the media, very fine perlite. This would actually be an example of when a germination mix was used uh, to transplant. Sometimes, you know, this certainly happens to me, you get in a hurry and you use what's available, but you can really tell the difference on a watering scale, how fast those different um, sizes of media drain. And so picking the right um, media for the right time can be a really important uh, step. Um, so, <laughs> Here is um, a not all that uncommon issue with peppers, right? Um, I seem to uh, have seeds, they're plenty moist, but I'm not getting any germination. Um, and so when it comes to really poor germination, temperature um, is often the first thing uh, that I'll talk about. I think late, a little bit later in the slides that I actually have a little graph with numbers that, uh, that backs this up. But you know, for peppers, for tomatoes, for our warm seeded crops, there is a world of difference between 60 and 75 degrees. And so spending a little bit of extra time and money to make that happen as far as um, heating or you know, providing the correct temperature is really essential. Um, here's a few notes. This is in one of our uh, publications. So you know, I don't need to spend uh, a ton of time on it. But just knowing um, that, uh, that getting up into those um, ideal ranges for our warm season crops is, is going to be essential. We can drop off a little bit when we get to the growing temperatures, um, but getting them up and germinated quickly is going to be essential for health, but also uh, productivity. Um, the other thing that often comes into play, especially for home gardeners, you know, who are seeding a few every year, is trying to make seeds last longer than what the appropriate life of that seed would really be. And so there's lots of differences in the seeds that we might use. Some tend to be, you know, a shorter uh, seed life, some in the medium, under good storage conditions, we might be able to get a little bit longer um, out of our tomatoes. But, um, but being familiar with what the best way to store those seeds are, um, in typically what we say is if you can add up the temperature and the relative humidity and that's less than 100, then those are more ideal storage conditions, right? So 40 degrees in the refrigerator, you know, 40 to 50% relative humidity, those would be reasonable uh, storage conditions. You can even use desiccant. I have little food safe desiccant packets that I use in the refrigerator um, for my wide collection uh, of seeds. And also keep in mind, especially for seeds that are starting to get a little bit older, is that seed germination and seed vigor can actually be different, right? Um, you can get a seedling to come up and germinate, but it just may not be a very vigorous seed. And so your seedling vigor can deteriorate over time, even if you're still able to get decent germination. Um, so, you know, so there's sometimes when poor seedling performance might still sort of be a result um, of, you know, of too uh, old a seed, even when you get germination. Um, these may be pretty familiar pictures, right? Um, light levels too low or temperatures too high when we start to get um, leggy transplants. And uh, I think that one thing um, that I always try to um, share with folks is um, the difference between, you know, how I can grow an okay house plant and what it would really take uh, for a good transplant for the garden. So this is just a really inexpensive uh, lux meter that measures foot candles. You can see this is my wintertime, you know, house plant in the front room, 50, 50 foot candles. Um, well, 
you know, according to kind of traditional greenhouse recommendations and, and calculations, um, we need about a thousand foot candles for 16 hours a day to produce a high quality transplant. Even if you were aiming for a mediocre transplant, you know, with half of that light, it would still be 10 times higher than what you are getting at, you know, in some of your medium to low light windows in your house. So um, supplemental lighting is really uh, going to be important for gardeners. Um, so um, whether it be fluorescent or the much more um, easily available now than they used to be, uh, LEDs getting appropriate distance and timing is going to be important. Um, these are just a few numbers that I made some um, light measurements a few years ago with a light meter and some brand new T5 fluorescent bulbs. And so those little one bulb systems, you know, that you can get that kind of sit on your table, well, they can be very helpful. But even if you put them pretty close and run them for several hours a day, you're only going to get um, about 75 or 80% of the optimum light. When you start to get into the two bulb and the four bulb uh, systems, and just, you know, to be clear, I was centering my tray right underneath of that light. So making sure that you're getting direct um, downward uh, uh, light movement is, you know, is very important. If you're off to the side or, you know, on the edge of that lighting fixture, then it's really going to drop off. Um, but two bulbs, you know, about nine inches away for 14 hours, four bulbs, same distance, but for about 10 hours, you know, so to get really good light on our transplants, we often do need um, to make sure that we include some additional light. Um, here's some hungry uh, little transplants. Um, there are some media that do have some, um, some fertilization um, in the early stages um, of those transplants. Um, if you, a lot of seedling mixes will have a little shot of fertilizer, but it's after three or four weeks in the tray, um, it decreases pretty, pretty quickly. And uh, this, I should say this could also be, you know, a, a pH issue. Um, but oftentimes uh, it's just the, the fact that we're, we haven't started early enough with our fertilization uh, regime. So lots of times when we get to true leaves, um, we'll kind of start fertilizing those a time or two a week. Uh, with a soluble uh, fertilizer, try to keep those leaves dry if you can, especially as the plants uh, get larger. And make sure when you water that you're watering thoroughly so that um, the water completely drains out the bottom uh, of the media and try not to keep that media wet. Let it uh, dry out a little bit on top. Um, here's an example of a media that almost drains too well, right? So these are some, uh, these are some tomatoes and you can see um, dried up leaves, um, showing uh, some rehydration, drying out, getting wet again. Um, and so I would, um, I would urge a little bit of caution with some of this really well-drained uh, media. This might be what we would use for nursery pots, right? A high percentage of, um, of a composted pine bark. It can be great for drainage and raised beds and large containers, but for small transplants, this can dry out pretty quickly, especially when you get those transplants. Um, larger. This is um, kind of a, a medium to high porosity grow out mix. Um, so this would be what I typically prefer when I talk about my cell packs and my older seedlings. Holds a reasonable amount of water but drains pretty quickly. And so it's all about finding that balance between how often can you water, how closely do you want to manage, and making sure that it's not staying too wet or drying out uh, too quickly. So um, we have, uh, we've done February with um, selection of our uh, cultivars. We've done March um, with, uh, with some good seeding tips and trying to avoid some of those ditches that we can run into with starting our own transplants. And so then hypothetically we get to April. And uh, April is that season of the year when our best um, uh, tactics are sometimes patience, right? Um, so avoiding seedling and uh, planting issues. Um, so some of the great things to keep in mind are that we can have uh, some, uh, some seed treatments and some things that can really help us out um, when it comes to getting up good stands of, um, of healthy um, direct seeded plants in the garden, um, whether it be traditional fungicides, um, which, um, you know, can be a great asset for, you know, uh, cucumbers and things like that, especially if they're more borderline on um, the earliness of our planting. Uh, but there are also a lot of biological materials that we can use and even some priming and pelleting, kind of some sophisticated seed techniques uh, that can be a help as well. So raw seeds, I tend to think of as the best option if we have very ideal seeding conditions, right? Especially if we're using them when our soil temperatures really are as high as they need to be. Um, fungicide uh, treatments can help us a little bit if we're kind of on the edge of the timing um, of our seeding. 
And uh, these are some of my favorite uh, tactics, raw lettuce, uh, pelleted lettuce. And um, not only are these clay coated pellets um, easier to handle, but also many times um, these seeds have also been primed before they've been pelleted. And so priming is a process where we carefully hydrate those seeds just a little bit and then cut off that hydration so that they are um, in essence, you know, starting their germination at the 10 or the 20 yard line. And so it helps them um, be more uniform and be uh, oftentimes more rapid and, uh, and, and vigorous in their transplant. So it can be a great asset. Good note though about these um, prime and pelleted seeds is you want to use them all in the first year there. Um, those practices do absolutely do not extend and they often shorten the storage life of seeds. Um, so the final note, and uh, this is probably the thing that we could all repeat the most um, to people when we get to the month of April, is to be realistic uh, about our soil temperatures and understand um, what the optimums are and the fact that sometimes a little bit of patience can actually get us further ahead. Um, so, uh, so these are some of kind of my favorite uh, numbers about uh, temperature um, and germination. And so what this really is, is just um, some timing of how long it takes these different crops to germinate at different temperatures, right? Um, so we've got our warm season uh, crops up here at the top. I mean, you can see, you know, 40 degrees, just nope, right? Not, not happening. Um, we get up to 60 degrees, right? Which um, sometimes, you know, can sometimes be a trigger for us. Oh, 60 degrees, you know, it should be fine. Let me just put it in the ground. But look at some of the durations of, uh, of these temperatures. Uh, over two weeks on beans, two weeks on cucumbers, over three weeks on uh, peppers, getting close to four weeks on okra. The okra always makes me smile um, because for our home garden variety trial, we always have okra, it's a high participant crop. But I typically find that during the month of April, I get a lot of questions back from our trialers. I think there's something wrong with this okra seed lot. I seem to be having really poor germination. You should check on that. I think there's a problem with this seed. And then once I get into May, I find that the problems with the seed lots almost miraculously disappear. Um, and so for some of our really, really warm season crops, um, temperature makes all the difference, right? You know, we're much shorter at 75 degrees. We get up to 80 or 85 degrees and uh, we have dramatically shortened uh, the time for really all of these seeds. In fact, Watermelon um, is really one of those interesting ones that like it will continue to germinate faster, even up to 95 degrees. Um, for our cool season crops, of course, we kind of see a little bit different curve. Um, lots of times, woo, the, um, the, the 75 temperature will be about where their peak is. And if you get them warmer than that, then they'll start to take longer and you get much above 85 and you're just wiping out those warm season crops. Um, this is just um, a little bit of um, more specific data when we talk about those root preferences um, of our young transplants. Um, so, you know, if we have nights that are below uh, 50 degrees, our peppers are not going to be happy. They really prefer days in the 70 to 80 range. Um, sometimes, you know, as far as high heat, some of those hot peppers can be a little bit more resilient, but none of them are very resilient when the soil temperature is 50 or um, 60 degrees. And the same thing is very, um, very true for uh, tomatoes. Their optimum soil temperature for growth as a young plant is, you know, 70 to 80 degree uh, soil temps. And once you get them below 60 degrees, those roots are just not doing much. So sometimes the best thing we can do in that early uh, to mid part of April is, you know, harden off our transplants and, uh, and be a little bit patient. Um, so uh, from uh, seedlings, um, so from selection in February um, to seedlings in March to seeding in April, um, hope there were some useful tips um, as far as your spring vegetable gardens. And uh, I'm going to stop the share and uh, let Melody take over the baton from there. Uh, Natalie, you had a question. Uh, can we order the seeds mentioned here from uh, the extension or do you know where they can be sourced? I think they're talking about the, the variety trial. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'll, um, I'll put the information and stuff in the chat box while Melody gets going. Okay. Can you see my screen there? Am I good? You're good. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to follow up with uh, fruit crops and just talk about some of those early spring chores that we need to be uh, performing kind of in the next few months. So um, I didn't kind of 
I guess break it out kind of like Natalie did there, but kind of sort of did. But some of the things we're going to talk about are just pruning, chilling hours, planting, spraying, grafting, irrigation, fertilizing, and mulching. So um, these are going to be some of those tasks we really need to be thinking about as we move into springtime. So of course, February is going to be that month that we really need to focus on pruning. Um, it's a great time to just be knocking out this chore. You know, we want to make sure that we're removing any diseased wood, any dead wood. Um, if you do have some of those issues, making sure that you pull that out and maybe even burning that because we know that's going to be a, a great source for some of those fungal pathogens that may have been left over from last year. So make sure that you're getting rid of some of that stuff. Um, as far as blueberries, um, we'll kind of start out with that. And just to let you know, I'm not going to go into a great detail on all of these because there's so many fruit crops. So I'm happy to share this with Darby because I've uh, put some links in the note box or in the notes section that will send you directly to to what is listed on each one of these um, slides. But just a few things to keep in mind is that um, blueberries, we really want to focus all their growth um, those first three years to everything below the ground. Um, so depending on kind of where you're at, you know, if uh, you're thinking about planting blueberries for this year, you know, um, it's a lot of people get bugged by the fact we tell them to prune those fruit buds. Uh, but that's really essential because, again, we want to focus everything um, into that root system and get it good and, and established. Um, if you have blueberries that are already in existence, uh, we just want to make sure that we're renewing that older wood. We want to make sure that pruning is, is being done. This is one of those things that's going to be an annual uh, chore for any of us that have these uh, fruit crops. And, um, and of course, that's going to be best performed when they are dormant. Um, just a reminder, there's different types of blueberries. So um, if you have blueberries already in place, uh, it's very helpful to know what kind they are because your pruning tactics are going to vary uh, between the rabbit eye, the northern high bush, and the southern high bush. So kind of keep that in mind. If you're looking to plant the, these crops, again, making sure you know what those cultivars are. Uh, look at some of those disease resistance. Um, and the other big thing is to just make sure that your site is prepared before you go to planting. So if planting blueberries is on your list this year, and I myself, I've gotten a lot of questions on that already because people uh, from COVID last year, they're wanting to plant more of these backyard fruit crops. So um, the big thing on blueberries though, is that they're persnickety when it comes to soil. So if this is something you're looking to do for the springtime, um, have you, have you performed that soil test? Have you got your soil down to a 4.5 to, I mean, a 4. Yeah, 4.5 to a 5.2? Um, do you have organic matter that's going to be sufficient? You know, these are things that you really need to think about. So if you haven't done that, I would suggest holding off on planting this spring. And um, I'm going to look at Natalie because, you know, we can speak from experience on some of our blueberry trials. Um, if you get too hasty, um, those plants are not going to love you for it. And they're just going to break down, stop growing, and just tell you um, they're going to give you a piece of their mind, ultimately, and they're just going to quit growing. And you're going to have to start from ground zero. So if you haven't done the soil test and all that, got your ground ready, wait till fall, do all that, and plant next spring. That gives you some more time to research all this. Because one of the biggest things with our fruit crops is going to be knowing what you're growing. And there's going to be a lot of variability between all of these. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these pruning shots because I'm going to kind of zip us through here. But again, these schematics are in there. Um, but you can notice blueberries, I think, are probably going to be one of the easier fruit crops um, to grow or to prune. Um, again, just knowing your fruit buds from your vegetative buds, pruning those out the first couple of years. Uh, we really don't want to be producing fruit uh, for the first three years. And that's hard for a lot of people because we want that instant gratification. But um, in the long term, it's it's just going to uh, keep the viability of those plants higher. Um, so anyway, there's schematics in there that'll kind of show you what to do. Um, make sure that you're thinning out those um, big old water sprouts here, some of those bull canes, uh, remove any of that weak fruit. Um, as you can see here from one to the other, the biggest thing is, is just getting that light penetration in there, uh, making sure you've got some airflow because that's gonna reduce um, the occurrence of some of those fungal pathogens. And overall, again, this is just gonna be a stronger, more productive plant in the long run. So I've already been kind of hitting on this um, three years to the first crop. Just remember that whether you have blueberries in existence or you're getting ready, to plant. Uh, just a picture here to show you that if you do, if you don't have that pH where it needs to be, um, you're always going to be kind of chasing after it. You're never really going to be able to, to catch up. Um, 
or you're going to have a lot of work in front of you if you do that. So if we don't get that pH just right, we know that oftentimes that's going to tie up other nutrients in the soil. So sometimes it leads to deficiencies, sometimes it leads to toxicities, but this is actually an iron deficiency in blueberries. Uh, we don't want to see that, but that's just directly pH related. That's not disease, but we see that a lot because people get too hasty and the, and the soil pH is not right. So that brings us kind of into um, chilling hours. You know, what are those? How important is that in, in our crops? You know, is it really necessary to, to know what these are? Um, which crops is it gonna be necessary on? Well, absolutely, because before a plant can actually break that dormancy, it's gonna have to accumulate um, a certain number of hours that are gonna be between like 32 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this is all going to, uh, have some bearing on that fruit bud initiation. So if chilling hours are going to be too low, then that plant's going to bloom too early, which can be bad, especially in my case in Northeast Tennessee because frost damage. Uh, so you really have to, again, know before you start planting any of these fruit crops what those chilling requirements are. If chilling requirements are too high, then that plant is going to break dormancy too late and then you're going to have leaf out that's very, very poor. So again, just know what your uh, chilling hours are for your specific region and just recognize that fruit and nut crops, those are gonna require those higher amount of chill hours. And again, that's just a cumulative amount of days uh, with that temperature 32 to 45. Um, I don't know if any of y'all experienced the 70 degree temperatures like we did here yesterday, but you know, that kind of messes with some of those um, chilling requirements. Uh, just a few notes on, um, on the blueberry. Again, before you purchase those, know what those chilling hours are. Uh, you'll notice there that southern high bush and rabbit eye are going to have lower chilling hours. High berries are going to have those higher chilling hours. So, you know, in Tennessee, uh, going to range between 1,000 and 1,400 um, chilling hours. Uh, just a few notes there too on blackberries and raspberries or caneberries there. Um, again, uh, moderate chilling hours. That's going to be pretty well suited for most of Tennessee. Raspberries, probably where y'all are at, are going to be pretty well uh, sufficient. Just recognizing that raspberries are going to be one of those things that do a little bit poorly in um, warmer, the, the hot parts of summer, uh, not, not really the winter cold per se. Um, in regards to cane berries, uh, looking into the month of February now, um, all of those are going to have to be trained and pruned as well. Um, there's a lot of difference between floricane and primocane bearing. And again, just an essence of time, I'm not going to go through all of that, but just know again the difference between those ty uh, two types. Those floricanes are going to need to be pruned multiple times. Primocane, that's going to be something that uh, you can mow down in the wintertime and, and be done with it. Um, that's kind of how you're basically renovating those um, cane raspberries. Um, I've circled some of these schematics in there so you can kind of see what those winter task, um, task list lists are uh, for how you need to be pruning. Uh, but you're basically just getting some of those lateral branches, branches the really vigorous canes out of there, uh, tying those up almost like in a finger top. That's what I always say about five canes. Um, and again, removing um, anything that fruited that first year and, and getting those out of there. And then this is your primocane bearing, uh, just making sure you're mowing those to the ground in late winter. So again, that was really fast, but I put these in there with notes on each one of those. Um, now is also the best time to be pruning our fruit trees. Um, this could be a, an entire topic just for a couple of hours in itself, as, as y'all well know, but um, pruning apple trees is going to be different from pruning peach trees, just recognize it recognizing the difference there. Um, also knowing that you've got different types of apple trees, the, the dwarf, the semi-dwarf, um, you know, how, how are you gonna prune these? Which ones are gonna better suit your needs? If you've got fruit trees that you've inherited or you've kind of let go, um, pruning neglected fruit trees, I put a, a publication link in there for that as well. But again, just knowing the differences and how we need to be doing that pruning, but now is the time um, to do that. Um, also, um, Pruning grapes and berries, all of these are going to require different types of tactics to pruning. But again, this is something that we need to be doing on an annual uh, basis because that's just going to maintain the vigor in the life of that tree. It's going to ultim ultimately make those fruit crops more productive in the long run. Um, otherwise, um, we have a lot of growers that kind of get to this point, that, and Natalie's like this too, you just go through with a chainsaw and start from ground zero. Uh, but again, when you're planting those fruit trees, um, pruning even that, you know, 
first year, making sure that you're managing uh, the growth of that plant is going to, to be the best in, in the long term. To go along with pruning, um, this is right out of our uh, publication. You've got a link to this, um, but our February, March, and April chores, I've kind of circled there. Um, it's really important to kind of start building your arsenal now for any cover sprays, any of those um, materials that you're gonna be utilizing throughout the season, because um, I have growers myself that think you can go out this time of year and put on that application of dormant oil, the lime sulfur, and you're done for the rest of the year. Uh, but you've got to start with those cover sprays. So start analyzing what you're going to need to purchase. Start going ahead and, and getting those because you, if you don't put on those cover um, sprays, actually, I think I have a note here. Yeah, if you're not putting these cover sprays on at the right time and you get into, um, into the season, a lot of those things could have been negated or mitigated long before um, June or July when you start seeing the issue and sometimes at that point we're not going to be able to do anything with it so again just making sure that you've got these know what your issues are um, keeping a journal of those kind of things cedar apple rust is a biggie um, you know putting on those materials at the right stage of growth in the season is going to help you uh, again mitigate some of those issues uh, moving on to grafting, um, this is going to be prime time to be doing some of this. It's not too late. You just want to make sure that those um, trees are still dormant. Uh, notice there that good sign wood is always going to be about a year old and it's going to be wood um, that grew that previous summer. Usually that's going to be found on the outermost part of the limbs or water sprouts. Just be really careful with those water sprouts because if it's near the ground or even below that graft union, uh, you may not know what that rootstock necessarily is. Um, as you can see there in the picture, uh, we've got some pretty predominant buds there. So make sure that you do have those intact when you do cut your scion wood. Um, cut those into pieces about pencil size is usually a, a good place to start with that. Um, make sure when you do um, cut these to make sure you wrap them in moist paper towels and store them in the refrigerator in a Ziploc bag. You might even have to double or triple um, the bag, especially if you've got any kind of other fruit, um, especially apples, anything that emits that ethylene gas because it can mess, mess with your wood. Um, as we move into March, this is typically when planting uh, begins. Um, these are some bare root apple trees. Just make sure that they don't dry out. Um, if you get them in too early, make sure that you heal those in the ground as with any of those. Uh, make sure you're dipping them in water, getting good, um, soaking on those roots before you, you plant them. Um, this is going to be especially true for the fruit trees and, and grape vines because they're a little bit more, again, finicky about those type things. Um, already kind of hit on this, make sure that you're prepping your soil before planting blueberries. Um, the other thing about blueberries is they lack those root hairs, so they're going to be a little bit more sensitive to some um, issues. So I always tell growers, you know, make sure that you've got organic matter, some kind of fluff, as I say, in there to help spread out that, that root zone, but you don't want to, to be putting any kind of fertilizer or anything in this hole because that can really burn those roots back and stunt the growth of that plant. Um, as far as when you're uh, planting cane berries, you can see there you've got bare root cuttings versus tip layering, kind of like um, how a forsythia um, reproduces or you've got tissue culture. Um, again, just make sure if you're ordering those bare roots to make sure you heal those in before you can plant. And then I just put a picture in here of your um, floor cane, prima cane, uh, what that's going to look like, making sure that you get those planted in the ground. Um, and you can kind of see from that, that picture there, but make sure that they're still dormant when you do plant to get the best vigor. Um, fertilizing fruit trees. Uh, now is the time to be doing that a month after bud break. So this is going to be one of those uh, task, lit, task uh, chores to do in, in March. Also the same for uh, blueberries. Uh, remember that blueberries typically will grow in those areas of um, low fertility. So um, you want to put on an application of fertilizer and then repeat that in about six weeks. If you have strawberries already in production, hopefully you've got some kind of material over that. Usually straw is what folks will use. But as we start warming up, um, there are going to be days when they're going to start initiating their flower set. So make sure that you're uncovering that as, as we get a little bit warmer. Who knows what Mother Nature is going to throw at us. Uh, but you don't want to leave those covered all the time because that will um, 
affect your fruit production in the long run. So you may have to be covering and uncovering with the straw um, for a little while until the temperatures uh, stable out. As far as moving into April, if you don't have stra uh, strawberries planted, this is a good time uh, to be doing that. Again, you just got to know what type um, does what in essence. So June bearing, um, this is typically what a lot of your commercial growers are going to grow that you'll see growing on plastic culture, a um, little bit bigger strawberry. Uh, these June bearers are going to put out a lot of runners, so they're throwing off daughter plants. So this is what we usually will plant in a matted row system. But for backyard home gardeners, a lot of times uh, folks will turn to the everbearing and date neutral. Uh, they can be grown in a container much better. Uh, the only probably con to grow in these is that they don't throw off um, as, as a large a yield as those June bearing berries do. Uh, but just again, um, remembering to now is not the time to necessarily be renovating these, but if you are planting just to know what the differences are between all of these. And then I've just listed some of those cultivars, but when you are buying plants, just make sure that they're disease free, um, you know, order those early so you're getting good selection. Uh, bare root plants do very, very well. So again, those are going to be shipped uh, this time of year. So you're going to plant those now. Um, strawberries, make sure that you do have really good drainage. Um, again, don't let those uh, plants dry out. So make sure you're dipping those in water before planting. And don't, um, don't add amendments either to your strawberries, you know, just um, keep it to the native soil. They'll do, they'll perform a lot better for you in the long in the long run. Um, also word of caution on fertility, don't be scattering fertilizer on those young plants because that can burn them, stunt them back. So don't do that, just keep them well watered. Uh, when you do go get those in, strawberries can be funny about their planting. Uh, you don't want to get them too deep. Don't get that crown too deep, but also don't get it too shallow. And make sure that you're getting the roots fluffed out here. You can see here, um, that's gonna reduce the potential of that plant. So making sure that you're uh, planting correctly. This shows you what that matted rose system looks like. So this is gonna be for a June bearing matted rose system. So this is the one that's gonna put out all those runners and have the daughter plants uh, that you can kind of keep in, a, in production for five to, to seven years. And then I've just put some um, notes in there about establishment that first year. One of the biggest issues with uh, strawberries is just keeping the weed control down, making sure that you've got good airflow there too. Um, especially true with that mulch when you go to um, protecting them from winter weather and then into the springtime, making sure that you're pulling that off. You don't want that uh, the ground or the strawberries to get too stagnant to keep that moisture in there because of course that's where we're going to have a lot of those um, pathogens start um, rearing their ugly head and it's a lot harder to control those at that point. So it does take a little bit of work once you get those uh, strawberries established, just running out there, covering them up every night, uncovering them during the day, but it's worth it in the long run. If you're using irrigation in any of your fruit crops, um, this time of spring is going to be the best time to uh, start putting that out, get all of that prepped and ready. Um, that's the last you know, step before actually planting. Uh, you don't have all the weeds to contend with and all that good stuff that you just get a better handle on things. Um, also fertilizing cane berries, blackberries. Um, this is when you wanna be doing that after those primocanes emerge, and then you're gonna wait till harvest before fertilizing again. Um, also kind of review your property. If you're planting these, what I call the tame berries, make sure that you don't have wild blackberries uh, growing nearby because um, that can lead to more disease uh, pressure with your tame berries. So be cautious with that. You might wanna remove some of those wild brambles. Um, this is also going to be the time to fertilize any of those stone fruits like uh, nectarines, peaches, um, apricots. Um, you usually will do that in two halves. You, you do it now and then it kind of depends on frost. Uh, that may be more of an issue in the mountain area versus uh, where, where y'all are at. But as you get out and start moving into the spring, just remember as we start applying those uh, cover sprays, just to spray ethically, we need bees for pollination. Um, the other thing I didn't mention was the cross-pollination factor. So if you are going to plant fruit trees or any fruit crop, um, look at that. Look and see if uh, what the cross-pollination uh, requirements are. Uh, but anyway, when you are applying those, make sure that you're doing it when the bees are less active. Um, that protects our pollinators. Another biggie kind of to go along with irrigation um, during this time of the year, um, making sure that we're thinking about the weed pressure. 
Um, how can we control that? Getting all that kind of lined out at the same time we're building our arsenal for our cover sprays and things like that because if we're utilizing mulching as a mechanism to control weeds, uh, we know that's going to help keep that soil temperature uh, consistent. We know that's going to help keep moisture levels consistent. That's going to help increase the survival and growth of those fruit crops. Um, none of our crops, be it fruits or veggies, like to compete with weeds. And we all know um, several crops like onions don't even, they'll just shut down if you get too much weed pressure. But overall, if we have that weed pressure, that is going to significantly um, reduce um, those fruit crops. So just keeping that in mind as you move forward um, through the season. Um, just know there's different kinds of um, mulching materials that you can utilize. A lot of folks will use um, sawdust for blueberries and or wood chips. This is what this is a pine bark mulch that we used out at the Greenville Center. So lots of different options that you've got for mulching. Just make sure that uh, you keep that orchard floor clean. And then um, I, we all know as we move into May and Natalie kind of, well, she alluded to this, said this in her um, section there as well, you know, as we, as we start getting hotter, um, it's not a good time to be planting any of these fruit crops. So if you haven't got any of these fruit crops really in the ground by the 1st of May, um, just hold off, wait till fall um, if it's applicable, applicable to be planting at that time, or just wait again until next spring because uh, your plants will appreciate appreciate uh, you for it and you'll probably appreciate yourself in the long run too because it'll be a lot less work. Uh, again, you're kind of uh, going to be running trying to, to do catch up with them if you do that. So if you haven't got them in the ground, just hold off. Uh, so with that being said, just enjoy spring, um, get all those chores knocked out and then hopefully um, you'll be off to greater success for managing your fruit crops. Okay, that was really fast. <laughs> but I got us right on time. <laughs> do we have any, I didn't have any uh, questions in the chat box, to, but do we have any questions for Melody or for Natalie? And I'm going to launch um, a poll for our um, priority team um, to uh, get a little information from you all, if you don't mind um, filling that out for us, we would appreciate it. But feel free to ask your questions as you're, you're doing this. And it was recorded and we will be putting this up on our um, Facebook page and we'll have it on our YouTube page and I will share it out to agents too. Okay, so it looks like uh, Richard has Maybe a question. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right. Did you did you say now is the time to uh, fertilize blueberries? The first fertilizing. Usually do that. It depends on the stage of the the plant. Um, you'll you will do that, and then you'll in like March and then you'll come back like six weeks later and add a second application. Um, Darby, I'll share this slideshow because some of those different stages, Richard, like you're talking about, we're gonna do it a little bit different depending on the, the age of that plant. And those notes are embedded in those slides. Okay, so yeah, I, plant, I planted uh, five gallon pots last year. They're all rabbit eyes, uh, three different varieties. And uh, they, they, they're doing pretty well, but I know that uh, I still have real issue with pH. I've been working on that. I can't seem to get it below five and a half as hard as I work. Mm. Lots and lots of sulfur. <laughs> I did that uh, this fall. So I'm getting ready to do another pH test here in a week or so and see, see what it looks like. Yeah, those first couple of years, you really got to stay on the pH be a major issue. All right, so I'll, I'll uh, put the calendar March the 1st to start uh, fertilizing then. And remember too, um, I didn't mention this, there's also container size uh, blueberry cultivars that are available now. So I had a few folks growing those last year, the patio type. So there's options for that too, if you don't have a lot of space. 
So I've got mine are all rabbit eye, and I've got uh, I got nine of them out last year, but they were uh, uh, pretty well established before I put them in the ground. Pretty big plants. Yeah, your rabbit eye can be pretty vigorous. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, and if it, if it's first year, sometimes on those blueberry plants. You'll wait a month or so to let the roots really start exploring the, you know, a month or two. Um, and Melody kind of mentioned this with, you know, not putting a lot of nutrients right in the, you know, the planting hole. But oftentimes we'll wait a little bit till those plants start getting established before we give them their first shot. All right, well, thank you for all the information. I'm gonna to have to go back to work. Well, thank y'all. Um, 